Well, hey, bro, peoples, this is Sonic Sanity 2, and welcome to another review. So, it's been over a year since I made my last review, and finally decided, you know what, let me do another one. So, in a brand new style, here's my review on Kingdom Hearts Rechat Memories for the PS2. I mean, PS3. Oh, ay, ay. time to get ready for the shitstorm. So a little history lesson on this game. Kingdom Hearts Che and Mary was originally on the Game Boy Advance in 2004 here in the US. Normally games that start on a console and go to handhelds are spin-offs. Well, this game is an exception. This game bridges the plots of Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2, so you need to play this game in order to understand what happens in Kingdom Hearts 2. A few years later, with the release of Kingdom Hearts 2 Final Mix in Japan, Damn it, Square! A fully 3D remake of the Game Boy game title, Kingdom Hearts Rechain Memories came out bundled with the Kingdom Hearts 2 Final Mix. Jump ahead a few years later and an HD port of the game came bundled with the 1.5 remix for the PS3, which is a version I'm going to be using for this review. Now before we get into the gameplay, let's talk about this story. All you Kingdom Hearts fans know how complicated the story gets, so I'll try to sum it up without getting into too much detail. So the game picks up immediately right where the first game left off, with Sorrow down the Goofy chasing after Pluto in that random meadow. Apparently the trio ends up at a mysterious castle called Castle Oblivion. After entering a mysterious black coat of being appears and utters a phrase that guess the main character is questioning it, he gives Sora a card and the trio begin their journey through the castle. Now begins the main gimmick of cards. Because of some stupid rules, cards are the main plot force in Castle Oblivion. Cards are essentially everything, physical and magic attacks, summons and gateways to worlds and doors. After using the first card, Sora ends up in Traverse Town along with a black coated figure. Sora learns that because of the castle's rules, Donald and the Goofy become cards every time Sora enters a world. So now Sora must go through every world and solve that world's problem. Again. And that's where one of my main problems with the game kicks in. Traveling to the world is so redundant. Nothing plot important happens in the worlds you travel to. You go through every world you visit in the first game except for Deep Jungle because of copyright issues. Even two new worlds added into the game. You even go to 100 Acre Woods because that world was so important in the first game. And it's just a bunch of mini games in this game. You just smash pumpkins, ascendant balloons, and even skydive. Oh, wait a minute. Of course. It all makes sense now. Okay, getting back to the plot. As you eventually do the castle, you run to new faces such as Axel, Larkseen, and Vexen. These characters are a part of something they refer to as the organization, and they plot to overthrow it utilizing Sora. Every time you meet these characters, they review new info that gets the main characters to think about what the hooded figure said to them before. And here's another thing that irks me about this game. Before I said nothing plot important happens in the world. Well, whenever you exit the world and enter a new floor, most of the times you either get the characters forget about something or think about what the hooded figure said, and at times it gets really unnecessary. Most of these cutscenes aren't even needed just because of how stupid they are. If they would have added less cutscenes and only put important stuff rather than pointless banter, I wouldn't have a problem with it. So as time progresses, you fight Riku because, why not, you meet a girl named Nami who possesses special power to tinker with one's memories, and Marluxia who turns out to be the hooded figure in the beginning of the game and has a serious case of gender confusion. Seriously, pink hair, really? And the characters forget stuff. Because of Naomi, Sora believes that he knows Naomi from his childhood and must save her and trust me when I say this, the final parts of this game where Sora remembers her gets really annoying with Sora always shouting Take a nap for all I care. I'm going to find Naomi. Naomi, can you hear me? Naomi? 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 So to sum up the final parts of the game, Axel kills Vexen, Larkseen dies, Ryukyu you've been fighting this whole time was really a replica created by Vexen, you kill Marluxia in a very anticlimactic and hard boss fight, and enter a restoration process for Naminé to restore the memories lost by Sora because of Naminé, how ironic. So now the story's out of the way, let's get to the main part of every video game, the gameplay. The combat goes as such, it's a battle between who has a higher card. Your enemy uses a card that has a value of 5, you use a card with a value of 5 or higher to break the enemy's card and attack yourself. If you run out of cards, you can reload your cards. Each time you reload a deck, you lose some cards. As stated before, cards are the main source of everything in the game. You can collect Keyblade cards, which are physical attacks, magic cards, summon cards, potion elixir cards. If you have three specific cards in a row, you can use something called a slate, which is essentially those moves that consume MP in the first game like ours, Arcanum, and Ragnarok. Ally cards are basically your friends, which can help you like Donald the Goofy, and in certain roles, other allies can pop up like Aladdin or Jack. You can customize your deck to be anything you want it to be, and that's one of the things this game has going for it. You can make your deck anything you want. Want a deck full of slates, a deck just for magic, summons, a jumble of cards for random attacks. The choices are yours, and yours alone. Throughout each world, you go through specific rooms that you influence using cards. Whenever you approach a door, a specific number and color will pop up, so you need to use a card that corresponds to that number. Sometimes the number is huge, so you need to use more than one card to open that door. 
Holy shit. Eh, Joker. Random Jokers are a type of card I want to bring special mention to because they can substitute any card whenever you're at a door and are really rare to find. So hold on to them to your dear life. The cards you use for each room influences how the room will turn out. In every room, there will be objects you can hit and sometimes health points or removal points which act as this game's currency will pop out. Using a calm bounty card will get you a chest with a Slater card. A Moogle room will get you a room with a Moogle who will sell you cards or turn cards into Moogle points. Using other cards can influence how many Heartless appear or how the room turns out. You can run to Heartless on the field, but unlike the first game, you teleport to a separate battlefield to fight them rather than find them instantly. You can run out of the field if you don't want to fight them, and trust me, you will eventually resort to running away because of how tedious the battles get. Every time you defeat a Heartless, you get EXP which you can use to level up. EXP is in the form of gems and will disappear after a short time so you need to get them ASAP. Whenever you level up, you can level up your health, card points which increase the amount of cards you can use in your decks, and certain occasions new slates. Progression in worlds go as such. You get 3 plot cards, reach the plot door, use the cards, watch the cutscenes, go to the final door, fight boss, leave world, lather, rinse, repeat, and it's the same thing for every single world. Once you reach Neverland, however, you can get a card called Key to Rewards which gets you a nice little reward. In the first game, you did something unique in each world, so it didn't feel like you were doing the same thing over and over again. In this game, it's the same thing for every world. No unique gimmicks. The only thing close to variety in each world is that in some worlds, special allies pop up. Besides that, every world is the same, but with a cosmetic change. The bosses could range from pathetic to ball-bustingly challenging. Every time you beat a boss, Sora will get a boss card and do a weird dirt face. Boss cards could grant Sora special abilities in battle when activated, like cards get stronger when low on HP or use double slate. One boss card I want to mention is Jafar. That card is disgusting in battle since no enemies could break your cards for 20 cards. The presentation for me is pretty hit or miss. For one thing, the cutscenes are way more animated than Kingdom Hearts 1 with the characters not being stiff like before. The voice acting is pretty good with Sora's balls dropping tremendously during the events of the first game in this one. The way the story is presented is also pretty hit or miss for me, with everything happening in the castle and the worlds having no reason to exist. The music is basically recycled from Kingdom Hearts 1, with some songs being used in future games, but the songs are good as expected from a Kingdom Hearts game. My problem with the game is that the combat could get very tedious. Unlike the first game, the combat isn't as fast and doesn't feel so satisfying. What would take you 1 minute to take out every Heartless on the screen could take up to 5 minutes if you don't know how to organize your deck. What was fun in the first game now becomes a huge chore. At times you don't even want to fight and we wish you could get the game over with. Another thing are the doors. As said before, sometimes you need a certain number and colors to open doors. If you don't have that card, you need to grind some enemies to get that card, and it could take hours to get it. As stated before, the worlds have no reason to exist. Plot doesn't happen in the worlds, and when it does, it's brief and only happens in like two worlds. And some of the bosses could be really tough, so slates are essential to beat those bosses. If you don't utilize slates, then good luck, because you're going to be stuck there for a long time. My last gripe is that this game is canon, so you have to endure this tedious and unnecessary game to understand the full story of the series and especially Kingdom Hearts 2. If you don't play the game, you're going to be asking questions like, who is this nominee? Why does Organization 13 not have 13 members? Who is Roxas? Actually, I, this game doesn't clarify that. But still, you guys get the point. I would say skip this game and read up on what happened throughout this game, but with this gem being released, I would say play it because if you're a devoted fan, you will probably get some enjoyment out of this game. So that's it for the game. A lot shorter than I expected, but hey, the less I gotta deal with, the better. No freaking way. Now begins the second half of the game, Reverse Rebirth. Now instead of playing as Sora, you play as Riku. In Reverse Rebirth, the story focuses on Riku as he tries to accept the darkness in his heart. Throughout the story, Ansem, yeah, that guy you killed in the first game, constantly torments Riku as he tries to convert Riku to the dark side. How is Ansem still alive, you ask? Since Riku was the host for Ansem in the first game, a little piece of Ansem remained in Riku and now he just pops up in a physical form. Now Riku must climb from the basement of Castle Oblivion all the way to the entrance as he encounters characters like the Riku Replica, King Mickey who helps Riku face his darkness, two new organization members, Lexius and Vexian, and members we met in Sora's story. Riku goes through all the worlds Sora goes through, excluding 100 Acre Woods. In a shocking twist, the worlds are a hell of a lot shorter than the ones in Sora's story. For Sora, each world could be 40 minutes to an hour, while for Riku, the most it could take you is about 35 minutes. The shortest I've done was 20 minutes. So, back to the story. As Riku progresses, he finally accepts the darkness and learns to live with it. When Riku enters Twilight Town, he meets a person named Dis, who turned out to be the fake Anton who appeared to Riku when the story started. He tells Riku he needs to see Nominate and get the same treatment as Sora. He denies Sora's treatment and decides to face his darkness head-on. He defeats Anson and travels with King Mickey to wherever. 
To be honest, I prefer how the story is presented in Riku's side because unlike Sora, they cut down on the cutscenes and only focus on important parts. Whenever there's a cutscene, it's either Riku facing the darkness or the organization plotting future things. And what's probably the one thing I love the most, it portrays a more darker side to this organization. What they do in Riku's story is some really dark stuff like Riku Replica absorbing the life force out of Zexion or Larxene threatening to erase Riku Replica's memory. Those scenes really struck fear into me and I wanted to see more of this menacing organization. Yeah, sure, Axel killed Vexen in Sora's story, but this is so much better. Now, the gameplay is exactly the same for Riku, except for three things. Because of this, Riku has a new ability called D-Mode. Riku can activate D-Mode whenever he brings a certain amount of cards. When on D-Mode, Riku gets more powerful as speed is increasing in new slates. Now for the biggest change for gameplay, Riku can't customize his decks. In every world, Riku has a specially chosen deck. What was the most fun and redeeming gameplay for Sora is taken out for Riku. Most people might find this stupid, but personally, it doesn't really bother me. For a majority of the worlds, the cards they give you are pretty good and they do have a decent amount of cards. So, personally, it doesn't really bother me. Riku can also activate duels. Whenever you and an enemy use two of the same number of cards, you have a set amount of time to break your opponent's cards. You succeed, you unleash a powerful attack. You fail, you get stunned. For a majority of the worlds, you only have one plot card and you can leave the world. That's probably what makes Riku's world so short now that I think about it. So that's my review for Kingdom Hearts Retain Memories. Overall, not a bad game, but if I were you, I would definitely skip this. Thankfully, this is the last time the card gameplay is used, but I still think that this game is worth at least checking out. But this review isn't exactly done yet. During the events of this game, another story takes place that bridges the gap between the first and second game. The game is Kingdom Hearts 358 Days Over 2, 358 Over 2 Days... Stupid tile I know, but let's just call it Days. I'm only going to go over the story because I don't own the game and it's only cutscenes in the 1.5 Remix. So the game follows Sora's nobody, Roxas. What's a nobody exactly? Well, a nobody is another being created whenever a person loses their heart to darkness. If their will is strong enough, a nobody that retains physical traits of the original person carry on to their nobody, as well as some memories. When Sora stabbed himself in the first game to save Kairi's heart in Hollow Bastion, his nobody, Roxas, was created. Why he doesn't look like Sora? Well, that's another story for another day. And no surprise here, the members of the organization are all nobodies. So the game follows Roxas' days as he works for the organization. He befriends Axel and meets a special nobody named Shion. Shion is connected to Sora and according to Naminé, Sora can't be restored because of Shion. See, Shion retains some of Sora's memories and gets the appearance of Sora's strongest memory, being Kairi. So Shion must be eliminated for Sora to be restored. A chain of events ensues when Shion eventually dies via Roxas. This puts Roxas into tears and this scene is powerful as nobodies have no hearts which means they cannot convey any emotions. Well until this game came along. So Roxas confronts Riku in a scene which should look familiar if you watched my LP on the first game. Riku defeats Roxas and Roxas wakes up in Twilight Town, thinking it was all a dream and the opening cutscene starts off for Kingdom Hearts 2. For what it's worth, I think the story is okay. It shows a more human side to nobody such as Roxas and Axel's friendship and it does die more into the politics of the organization. Plus, it is heartwarming whenever Shion and Roxas interact in a romantic way, but the dialogue sometimes could just be weird. Shion, who else will I have ice cream with? See what I mean? So that's mainly it for this review. So if you like what you see here, like, comment, subscribe if you want. And if you like the style I'm doing our reviews, then good for you because more reviews are coming in the future. I don't know when, so you, you guys just have to wait and see. So your way though, peace out, people. It's Berber. Stay golden. <laughs>